We'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Tabor's third and final presentation during our Caribbean semester. I'm not going to give him the full introduction as I did last hour because the audience is largely the same, but Dr. Tabor is an assistant professor of history at Fayetteville State University in North Carolina. And so his first two presentations have been on Haiti. This one is going to shift gears a little bit and it's on foreign aid. Who is it good for? So once again, please welcome Dr. Robert Tabor. Hello again to everyone. Uh, this one's a little different in that I don't have a fancy slide deck uh, to take you through. I'll mostly just be speaking as a giant head at the start of the at the front of the auditorium, which is probably stranger for you than for me because I'm just talking to my computer. Uh, and it will be a little bit or a lot about Haiti. Um, it's also going to be about politics in a large degree because politics is at the end of the day, yes, about ideals, but also about resource distribution. And when we engage in foreign aid, we are distributing resources. I remember when I was living in St. Mark in Haiti, uh, one of the things that you know struck me was not physically struck me uh, was a truck that had been donated by the Republic of China, meaning Taiwan. And it said on the side of it, a gift from the Republic of China to the people of Haiti. This very ostentatious aid to show that Taiwan cares about Haiti. And there were other places where I would see stuff from the People's Republic of China or China, um, you know, as they were engaging in what we call the soft power diplomacy uh, related to foreign aid. Haiti has been described as a republic of NGOs, of non-governmental organizations, where in lieu of a strong state, you know, the state is there, meaning the government, but that a lot of day-to-day -day decisions or the institutions that people interact with on a day-to-day -day basis tend to be uh, non-profits, non-governmental non-profits, whether those are religious organizations or humanitarian organizations or what have you. And I remember when I was, uh, when I was 19, 20, living in Haiti, I tended to be somewhat suspicious of these organizations uh, because to me, they struck me as all being kind of the same where they'd have a compound, a uh, high wall, all that kind of thing. Inside the wall, there would be a school, there'd be some other things, you know, sometimes some like food programs, giving people meals. Uh, the school would be about, you know, hygiene in the Bible um, and, you know, little sort of basic literacy type stuff. Uh, and the kids who went to the school all had sort of the same uniforms. You could tell whether they were going to the Adventist mission or the uh, Salvation Army mission or to the Methodist mission. Um, and I remember in Tigua, there was just sort of this like row of different compounds. One day, uh, we actually had to go to one of these little compounds because uh, my roommate, a um, uh, person who I worked with sort of day in, day out, he got an ear infection. And so we went down to the town clinic, but the town clinic was closed because the next day was Mardi Gras. And we were talking to some folks and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Cubans have uh, a clinic just a couple of miles down the road. And so we biked out and found there, sort of cut into this section of jungle, um, a clinic run by these Cuban doctors. And we knew Creole, they didn't really. Most nonprofit volunteers, even staff who are there long-term never really learned that much Creole. They get by on French or Spanish or English, uh, learning maybe a few phrases or something like that. Um, but, you know, they didn't have much Creole. We didn't have much Spanish. My buddy was from Quebec. Uh, so we just added, you know, A's and O's at the end of Creole words sort of randomly. Uh, and that was close enough to explain to the Cuban doctors that he has an ear infection. Um, and so they looked at him a little bit and then came down the stairs with this big bag of antibiotics, told him to take them like twice a day and he left. And we hadn't known that the Cubans were in town. They had never heard of our um organization uh but there we were sort of these two different groups engaged in sort of this soft power diplomacy and in fact cuba trains a lot of doctors and sends them around the caribbean uh, as their foreign aid is providing these medical services 
Uh, and it's a fascinating thing. The book Dictator's Handbook goes into a lot of detail about how um, corrupt governments, not saying that the Haitian government at the time was corrupt, but just the corrupt governments, dictators, bad governments, really like nonprofits that bring in healthcare um, and you know education up to a certain extent, not like overthrow the government level extent, but basic sort of things so people feel like their needs are being met. Uh, because they take over these sort of obligations of the state to care for their people uh, without any cost to the state. And so the people are happier with the government in power uh, because these needs are being met without any having to actually spend any sort of tax money or anything else on people. And so aid, general welfare stuff is about resource allocation. And that foreign aid is fundamentally tied to these ideas of foreign policy, of what's our reputation in the world, and then also to domestic policy concerns. What is it that we're going to give away around the world? It's probably gonna be stuff that we make a lot of here because it's subsidized and the people who make it make political donations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is not to dissuade you from voting. Um, if you haven't already voted, go vote. Uh, there's lots of great uh, nonpartisan voting sites you can check out, but to just, help you understand that this question of foreign aid is fundamentally tied to both the politics inside the country where the foreign aid is going, as well as the politics of the country that is providing the aid. These are two basic principles to keep in mind as we move forward. We have to be thinking about the country, the receiving country's politics and the giving country's politics. And with that, let's talk about the Clintons. So, in early 2010, shortly after the devastating Port-au-Prince earthquake in Haiti, Chelsea Clinton wrote to her parents, President Bill Clinton, who was helping oversee uh, the post-reconstruction aid with President George W. Bush and the sort of typical bipartisan last two presidents kind of deal with major disasters sort of situation, and her mom, Hillary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State. In a seven-page memo, she detailed the problems with the United Nations and nonprofit communities' response to the Haitian earthquake of January 2010. When the State Department released the memo in 2015, after House Republicans on a Benghazi investigation had requested all the emails, many critics of the nonprofit community praised uh, Chelsea Clinton's insight, which predicted the ways that a top-down, outside-in response was ignoring not only the needs of Haitians, but the way Haitians were already organizing themselves to improve security and see to basic necessities. That a lot of people were just coming into the country and telling Haitians what they needed instead of either observing and seeing what was going on or you know, asking Haitians on the ground what they needed and how they could help. Um, to her credit, her mother, uh, Hillary Clinton, echoed this response in the spring of 2010. Uh, Secretary Clinton said that the donor community uh, who wanted to help Haiti and were making all these big pledges, had a responsibility to, quote, do things differently in Haiti. It'll be tempting to fall back on old habits, to work around the government rather than to work with them as partners, or to fund a scattered array of well-meaning projects. You know, think about those compounds in the schools, teaching kids how to brush their teeth for like the sixth time in that child's life. Not necessary. Um, rather than making the deeper long-term investments that Haiti needs now. We cannot retreat to failed strategies. I know we've heard these imperatives before, the need to coordinate our aid, hold ourselves accountable, share our knowledge, track results, but now we cannot just declare our intentions, we have to follow through and put them into practice. But the donor community didn't listen. Um, as Jonathan Katz, who had been in Haiti for about two years at the time of the earthquake, uh, as the AP reporter on anything happening in that country, um, and was the only foreign correspondent to actually be on long-term assignment in Haiti, so he wrote, the big truck that went by, how the world came to save Haiti and left behind a disaster, um, which is one of the big analyses of what exactly happened in the country post-earthquake. And so he writes that much of the $16.3 billion pledged for relief and recovery efforts in Haiti was never meant for Haitian consumption. And as humanitarian relief spending continued to trickle in through 2010, adding up to, in the end, about 2.43 billion, at least 93% would go right back to the United Nations or non-governmental organizations to pay for supplies and personnel or never leave the donor states at all. And so this is a conversation that we're accustomed to happening, having somewhat when we talk about charitable giving here in the United States. 
is you want to look at this idea of you know sort of the charity's scorecard in how much of the money that's given to any sort of nonprofit uh, goes into just basic overhead, keeping lights on in the building, salaries for their senior executives, um, and so on and so forth, versus actually going to the dedicated projects uh, that we that the charity is ostensibly doing. And there have been there's been, been at least one congressional race uh, this election cycle where one of the challengers uh, charities that he claimed to fund mostly just funded him rather than any of the projects around criminal justice reform that he claimed were helping. Anyway, all about resource allocation. Um, what's more, says Katz, despite the emphasis donors placed on transparency, uh, most of the money turned out to be very difficult to trace. Uh, you know, after of all the pledges and what was given, 6%, $151 million couldn't be accounted for at all. Just 1%, slightly more than $24 million, which sounds like a lot to you and me, but is really not much when it comes to running a country, went to the Haitian government. Had Preval, the president of Haiti, or the parliament stolen every cent of their share, and there's zero indication that they did, it would have made very little difference in terms of how much money actually made it to Haitians on the ground to help them build back better, which was the motto of the reconstruction effort. And so what we then had six years later is that in the 2016 presidential campaign, a lot of politics this time, a lot of politics. Uh, Donald Trump claimed that the Clintons had ripped off Haiti and as part of an outreach effort in, South, in the South Florida community of Little Haiti said to all our friends in Haiti and in Little Haiti, your day of justice is coming. And it arrives on November 8th, a reference to election day or the day the election ended that year. As reporter Bob Woodward uh, wrote in his book, Fear, after the campaign stop in Little Haiti, Trump said, I really felt for these people. They come from such a hole. Presaging his much more famous, much more infamous comments about the African continent in Haiti a couple of years later. Um, and we're at the run up to another election. Voting ends on Tuesday. And both Trump and Biden's campaigns are doing outreach to Little Haiti again this year. And in fact, Senator Harris's chief of staff, Corinne Jean Pierre, is a Haitian American woman from New York City. And a key issue in South Florida, again this year, involves the Trump administration ending temporary protected status for Haitian migrants who came here after the earthquake. But we're not here to talk about the election, we're here to talk about foreign aid. And so, but the reason I'm starting with all of these stories of what foreign aid looks like, about resource allocation, about political debates about all of this, uh, three reasons that we start with these stories. One, as I mentioned at the top, the political decisions that happen in the United States have an impact around the world, especially in countries like Haiti that are close to us and where ties of migration, trade, and culture go back centuries. It's not that the story of the United States and Haiti started in the 1980s, far from it for those of you who are with us in the last hour, this is something that goes back to the 1700s, if not before. I mean, just as a quick example, now, Roanoke, the Lost Colony, that story of the settlers of Roanoke, et cetera, et cetera, uh, disappearing, not being there when Captain John White shows up and they've written Croaton into the tree and so on and so forth. Earlier on that voyage, John White had stopped in Haiti when it was a Spanish colony uh, to trade or to plunder the town of Leogon. Now, these ties go back centuries. This was in the late 1500s. Um, so what we do here, the decisions we make in the United States have an impact around the world. Two, the way we conceive of foreign aid and foreign policy and foreign countries more broadly is too often about us and not the people in the countries who feel the impact. Three, one of the most dangerous self-defeating ideas that we can have of a place and the people who live there is this idea that it's a whole, that we can't mess it up further, that we can treat it however we want, that we can't make it worse, that it can be a place for our own projects, triumphs, glories, and goodness. And Haiti often fulfills this position in the American imagination. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of a free press. Journalists do hard jobs under difficult conditions. Um, but there's always that tendency towards spectacle, that tendency toward uh, the sensational, 
You know, there's a saying in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, there have been some famous things and social media has been interesting dynamic here of, you know, when there's a big protest in a city and there's this picture of a trash can or a car on fire, it's just the one fire. And there's this image of like 15 journalists all circled around it, taking a picture of that one trash can or that one car that was set on fire. But you get this image of these cities are burning when they're really not. And this is the same thing that happens in Haiti. Haiti, Haitians are people. Um, people are people. Haiti is a place of extreme inequality uh, where there are some people who are very rich and other people who are very poor. Uh, and generally speaking, they don't like it when foreigners come and take photographs of them and their living conditions without their permission. And there's been some critique in the last few years of what's known as, for lack of a better term, poverty porn, where you get these images of people living in squalor that you then use for fundraising or to like get eyeballs onto your own story or whatever else. Um, and there, there's been a lot of pushback from people in the aid community that this is actually really problematic. Haiti in the American imagination was briefly on display again this month, um, these past few weeks as the Republican Senate and the White House engaged in a public relations blitz to seat now Justice Amy Coney Barrett uh, before the end of the election next week. One thing that came up on social media a lot was how dare you call her racist? She's adopted two children from Haiti. Critics noted that when she discussed her Haitian born children, Justice Barrett, now Justice Barrett, tended to highlight their resilience and athletic prowess. And while talking about the intellectual and scholastic achievements of her white children. But there was again, again, this connection with Haiti, the image of Haiti is a place that needs saving, Haitians as needing rescuing. This is to not say that all aid is bad, that we can't help other people. Um, you know, it's like, wait, you've dragged two US presidents, a former Secretary of State and a Supreme Court Justice, you know, aren't serving and helping people good things. Doesn't the world get really dark really quick if we're not helping others? It does indeed. But to help others, we first, again, we first have to listen to them. And when we talk about entire countries, as poor but happy, uh, which is honestly the polite equivalent of calling them a whole, we've stopped listening and instead retreated to our own imaginations. And there have been many cases where we've gone in and helped without listening or by listening to other people or without thinking about the consequences of our actions. Um, you know, one of the most dramatic moments after the earthquake was uh, naval trauma surgeons from the US Navy going in and when people have you know, damaged limbs, broken bones, just amputating them instead of putting them onto a longer path of recovery that would then lead to greater mobility um, because long-term care is someone else's problem. So I'm gonna tell you two stories now. The first story is about rice and the second story is about pigs. So first story is about rice. Uh, for decades after the Haitian revolution, Haiti was a net exporter of food. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the last hour, uh, people fled the sugar plantation. They wanted to be free. And once they were free, once they were living in the mountains, they grew coffee for export. But a lot of beans, corn, um, sorghum, yams, bananas, other foodstuffs, um, rice would become part of that, you know, a piece of it. Uh, by the 1970s, 1980s, Haitians were eating rice about twice a week. Uh, it's much more common now for reasons we'll get into in a moment. Um, but Haitian farmers are, were a pillar of the rural economy and they were protected by some really incredibly high tariffs on food, making it difficult to import food into the country, but also making sure that there was a strong domestic supply. The farmers were there, um, the farmers could make it a living uh, growing food. A lot of this uh, that I'm about to tell you comes from a foreign policy report called Subsidizing Starvation and has to do with the Haitian rice deal of 1995 and some Arkansas rice farmers who made a lot of money. Um, Haiti now, you know, went from being a net exporter of food to being the fifth largest importer of American rice in the world, despite having just a population of about 10 million. Much of Haiti's rice comes from Arkansas. Um, 
Haiti today imports over 80% of its rice from the United States, making it a critical market for farmers in Arkansas. Over half the rice that's grown in Arkansas is grown for export. Um, and there's some towns just outside Little Rock that are basically the place of major rice mills. Uh, development experts argue that while the US exports may feed people cheaply in the short run, they've made poverty and food insecurity in the countries that are receiving these exports significantly worse. And that the subsidies, we subsidize rice extensively, are largely to blame. Said Mark, Mark Cohen, a senior researcher on humanitarian policy and climate change in Oxfam America, the support that US rice producers receive is a big factor in why they are a player in the global rice market and the leading source of imported rice in Haiti because we subsidize them so much. They know that they're gonna get a certain amount of payments. If governments that preach trade liberalization in Geneva would practice it, you know, at the um, World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund, these big multinational institutions, um, and that includes reducing domestic support measures that affect trade, meaning subsidies. If everything was on a level playing field, that would be very helpful to Haiti. It's the end of Cohen's quote. From Regine Barjan, the marketing director of the Miami-based Haitian American Chamber of Commerce, talking about Haiti. You have a country which is 70% farmers and you're importing 60 to 70% of your food. You know, the country may have 700,000 hectares of underutilized arable land. That's a lot. Uh, but it nevertheless maintains chronic trade deficits and has levels of food secu security that are only slightly better than those of Somalia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so there's a lot of debate on, you know, what happens when we reduce rice subsidies, what happens if we raise tariffs, you know, we had dropped them from 50% to 3% uh, in 1995, where the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and the Clinton administration basically forced the Haitian government to secure loans uh, to accept much lower tariffs on rice. Uh, and so there's all this really cheap rice that floods the market. When I was growing up, Haiti exported rice, sugar, coffee, beans, a lot of things, said Joseph Perard, who runs an organization in Port-au-Prince called the Lambi Fund, which funnels money for development to farmer collectives in the countryside. Like a lot of Haitians, the 72-year-old Perard is keenly aware of the history that has contributed to the dismal state of agriculture today, which is a lot of stuff we've already talked about. But you know that there's the large domestic farming economy in Haiti that continued through much of the 20th century. Um, after the democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, was ejected through a military coup, a lot of the countries of the world responded with um, by cutting off trade, various tariffs, embargoes, et cetera. When the trade embargo was finally lifted in 1994, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank uh, stepped into the void and they presented basically this, this loan program um, or what's known in development circles as a structural adjustment program aimed at getting the country's economy back on track. But what that means is making it very easy for foreign merchants, foreign exporters, uh, lenders, et cetera, to do business in the country. Among their conditions, as I mentioned, was lowering tariffs on food imports, a policy Haitian farmers now call Plan L'Amour, or the death plan. Um, and then soon after, President Bill Clinton signed the Federal Agricultural Improvement and Reform Act of 1996, uh, which shifted farm policy to direct payments for farmers for these subsidies, including massive rice subsidies. Uh, and Bill Clinton actually sub, uh, apologized for this rice deal, for the Haitian Arkansas rice deal in 2010. And so, um, you know, today most farmers in Haiti have an income level of just $400 per year, whereas in the United States, farmers make well above the median uh, income for Americans. And Haitian farmers view the policies that brought them to the state as not just bad economics for Haiti but also as an ongoing assault by foreigners on their cultural independence. Says Ferry Pierre Charles, an agronomist with the Lombi Fund, it was a campaign against Haitian culture. We have a lot of big people here, but they're coming to take care of their in own interests. They don't really care about local production. Um, and there's quotes in this foreign policy report from farmers talking about when the American rice, when the Arkansas rice came in. It was almost for free, one farmer recalls. It was like a gift which then made it impossible for them to sell their rice. And so we have to think, you know, we have this image, we have this motto in the United States about our farmers feeding the world. But when we're doing that, when we're subsidizing our farmers and exporting so much food, 
what local economies elsewhere are taking the hit, what damage, what unforeseen or foreseen consequences uh, result uh, from this idea. The other story about good intentions gone wrong comes from Gerald Murray, a retired professor of anthropology at the University of Florida, who has written extensively about Haitian agriculture. Uh, this is the story of the Creole pig. Uh, this is a hardy pig, you know, much like sort of the Razorbacks. I know there's a lot of Arkansas here, which is awkward speaking to. Anyway, apologies. Um, capable of scavenging and surviving, and it becomes a major tool in the economic survival strategy of the peasant household. So, you know, a lot of crops are sold. Um, some of the money is spent immediately, but much is saved for the rainy for a rainy day, sickness, funeral expenses, weddings, sending kids to school, etc. A major traditional goal is the accumulation of enough cash to buy more land if and when it suddenly becomes available. But instead of just keeping all the cash as cash where it can be easy to steal, you know, the banks are basically the pigs. Uh, you feed the pig, you raise the pig, you sell the pig. Um, few pigs are raised for home consumption, except for, you know, on occasion as part of rigid, religious rituals. Rather, they're seen as a source of savings that can be easily mobilized easily used when the need arises. Um, as the agrarian economy declined across the 20th century, two things happened to the pig. First, its relative economic in importance increased um, because it's more durable. Uh, with deforestation, soil erosion, and decreased rainfall, the risk of agricultural failure in increased. And so having that backstop of the pig was more important um, and livestock became more important. Secondly, the sale of pigs was used increasingly as a vehicle for liberating one's children by sending them to school in hopes that they would qualify for jobs in the city. That that's when you sell the pig is when your kid's ready to go to school, you can send them to school so they can get a good job in the city. By the late 1970s, it's estimated that there were, may have been 1.2 million pigs in Haiti, but then there was a pandemic um, among the pigs of African swine flu, which first made its way into Haiti in 1978 from the neighboring Dominican Republic. So there are large numbers of pigs that die, in 1981, a powerful consortium of different foreign institutions, uh, including from the US government, uh, State Department, and a couple other governments, uh, convinced the Haitian government of three things. One, they needed to kill all pigs in Haiti to stop the pandemic. Two, they needed to compensate the farmers for doing so. And three, they needed to supply new pigs. The first happened completely, quite predictably. Two and three only happened sporadically. Uh, some claim that the epidemic was bogus and the slaughter was unnecessary. That's questionable. Whereas about 400,000 pigs were killed, as many as 600,000 may have died of African swine flu. Two things, however, are unquestionable about this moment. One, the foreign swine carefully selected as replacements were of a diversified and high quality genetic stock, but with their requirements of special pens, commercially purchased feed, and regular veterinary services, they were poorly adapted to the economic conditions prevailing in rural Haiti. As one farmer complained, the foreign pig lives in a better house and eats better food than we do. Two, though the pigs were killed, neither the compensation nor the swine repopulation happened as planned and promised. USAID money was managed um, by a branch of the Organization of American States. Uh, it was slow coming. Serious attempts were made to ensure equitable distribution, but it was easier to kill peasant pigs than to program equitable distribution of follow-on resources to seed sort of the project all the way through to compensation. Um, and the elites ended up benefiting. The rich got richer while the poor got poorer. Welcome to Haiti. In the pig slaughter of 1981, hundred million dollars was at stake. 30 years later uh, in post-earthquake Haiti, the dilemma of dysfunctional and predatory institutions persists. Um, now, this is Dr. Murray. Now the big league predators are foreign NGOs, not the Haitian government. And now there are billions waiting to be invested or diverted. And this is you know, what Katz was writing about at the top um, about just how much of the aid that was pledged after the earthquake went to sort of the funding agencies uh, in those countries rather than to Haiti. Uh, and they would send in foreign workers to work in Haiti who spent some money, but it's not the same thing as employing Haitians directly. So this is pretty grim from the rice and the pigs and the compounds. What do we do? Is there a good way to do foreign aid? Is there a more beneficial way to do foreign aid? And that's where we get to the example of Paul Farmer, Dr. Paul Farmer and Partners in Health. And so what Partners in Health has done 
is over the past 20 years, 30 years now, um, they've developed a community health worker program, uh, which is all about building local capacity. What that means is it means they're hiring Haitians on the ground, training them to be community health workers, and then uh, promoting them uh, into senior positions in the agency. In political or community organizing, there's this idea that your job as an organizer is to organize yourself out of a job. Um, that, you know, if you're in an area, your job is to train people, um, help them take action on their own, provide some resources, provide some other support, and then to get out of the way while they're going and doing that. And that's a lot of what Partners in Health is doing with the clinics that are staffed by Haitians, um, run by Haitians, with Haitians who are paid, and then they're able to send their kids to school, which has these long-term beneficial impacts. That if you're just coming in for a week to build a school rather than to run it, or even to run it, um, rather than to hire local people to run it, uh, your impact is gonna be minimal. And maybe people didn't want a school built there. Maybe that's where they were growing bananas. Maybe that's where they were growing rice. Maybe you should have asked before you just build a school. Um, and so we need to be mindful of local needs. We need to be talking to people, be thinking about, you know, what can I actually bring to the table? Uh, and keep that in mind, that servant leadership is a real thing in that way, but also that if you're providing service, it should be of service, which means that people want it, need it, and have asked for it. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Dr. Tabor? Dr. Tabor, thank you for your uh, splendid presentation. When I was a teenager in the 1950s, there was a book that came out highly critical of foreign aid in Southeast Asia called The Ugly American. It's based upon the same principles that you seem to be talking about now. And I'm surprised in this age of data, information, NGOs, that this still seems to persist. Do you have a comment on that? I mean, I think part of it is, you know, it's hard to distinguish foreign aid from being a tool of empire, being a tool of foreign policy. And so there's always sort of going to be that, that sort of that natural marriage between, between the two. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the problems. And this is, this is one place where it can become easy to become cynical. Um, but I think one thing that, you know, I think Farmer shows, Paul Farmer shows and Partners on Health, Partners in Health shows, is that sometimes foreign aid can work best, not necessarily will work best, but can work best if it's not directly a state project. And so you're not as tied to the foreign policy interests of a particular government, the changes in administration, um, whatever else, that if you're trying to provide resources and capacity to people, that it's best to have your own independent access to resources and capacity. Um, yeah, no, and so there, there's also a question in the chat on the differences between NAFTA uh, and the new United States, Mexico, Canada agreement on foreign trade. Uh, my story really ends in 2015, 2016. I apologize. I can't get into that at uh, that moment and speak of it intelligently, uh, but it's a good question. And I want to dig into that and see what kind of impact uh, that might have. Um, so no, I mean, there's, there's some good analyses that we can get in there in terms of what that trade deal is in general. Um, but yeah, I'd have to really look to see what the foreign policy stuff is. So sorry, Kelly, thank you for your question. And I'm excited to look into it. But other questions? Yeah, thanks again, Dr. Tabor. Um, I'm going to say that dreaded phrase. My question is more of a comment. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that it strikes me is that the criticisms you've leveled against foreign aid are exactly the same kind of criticisms about domestic charity programs as well, which is that they have the effect sometimes of not necessarily addressing a need, but rather 
creating a need that then the charitable organization is the only thing that can fill, right? Uh, creating a need where one does not exist before or creating a new type of need, a need and, and making the, the NGO itself a newly, um, a newly essential service in some regard. And I'm just, I guess I'm wondering if that's sort of a dynamic that has played out in Haiti since the earthquake as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, and I think, I mean, I think even well before the earthquake, like it was already referred to as the Republic of NGOs uh, before the earthquake. And I mean, I think also something that is becoming more common too is looking at how our own domestic policy kind of mirrors our own kind of neo-imperial or neo-colonial neo policy in terms of foreign aid or doesn't. Um, and there's there's some chatter in, for example, ag circles about how a lot of our aid that goes to rural areas in the United States, uh, when we stack up, you know, sort of the way we've shifted foreign aid or tried to ship foreign aid to be going more toward women, to small businesses, to entrepreneurs on the ground, rather than getting siphoned off by large landowners, that when it comes to our own ag policy within the United States, uh, we haven't caught up in that same way, that we're still giving a lot of the, bulk, the bulk of the subsidies and the money uh, to the major landowners, uh, the ones who are least in need of it, um, rather than trying to grow and expand local capacity for civil society and grassroots governance and all that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, and like one of the things that's always a debate when we talk about any sort of service is who's providing the service, what they get out of it, um, that we like to shrink government. That's often seen as a good thing. But then what that means is that the contractors who are now providing the service uh, can make real money. And there's some studies that in some ways, government contractors cost twice as much as just by having it be a government provided service. And certainly in North Carolina, I don't know Missouri's politics that well, uh, in North Carolina where I am, there's a big debate over uh, public funds for private schools and what kinds of regulations uh, are going to be placed on the private schools in terms of curriculum or outcomes when we're diverting funds that are generally meant for public education to these private funders. And then there's always sort of that political chase uh, for community grants and resources and whatever else, where it feels like every not every politician has their own sort of pet nonprofit uh, that they're running to show what a good person they are that may or may not be doing any good actually in the community. Dr. Tabor, I think you have uh, some Zoom questions, and if you wouldn't mind reading those aloud to us for the benefit of, of us in the audience. Sure. So the first one was about the difference between NAFTA and the new USMCA uh, on foreign policy, which I'm not qualified to answer in any sort of way. The other one is, uh, to an extent, is it fair to consider foreign aid as a glorified form of imperialism? Um, and, you know, imperialism is such a strong word, but certainly foreign aid is, yeah, intimately tied to foreign policy, uh, to soft power. I mean, this is what our State Department does. It's what the foreign ministries of other countries does, is soft power, making people think good things about us. Um, in Fayetteville, we have the 82nd Airborne um, and a lot of other units stationed at Fort Bragg, uh, including a lot of PSYOPs, um, where, you know, in Afghanistan or various undisclosed places in Africa or elsewhere in the world, uh, their job is to get people at other places to think good things about the United States. And that's a little easier if there's, being, if there's aid that's being provided, they're able to tell those kinds of public relations stories of, hey, here's what we can do for you. Here's what we are doing for you. Isn't the United States government great? Don't you agree? Um, and so, yeah, no, I mean, in terms of uh, our own foreign policy, the foreign policy of other countries, uh, foreign aid is uh, deeply and intimately tied uh, to the agendas of those various countries. Um, and there's some, some interesting history looking at uh, the role of missionary organizations and others um, across the 19th century and into the 20th century. Uh, in, in the role of US foreign policy as we're also going and invading various countries and pushing for various things, such as the open door policy in China uh, to get access to trade. And I mean, a lot of my state was built on a man named Duke getting to sell cigarettes to East Asia, um, thanks to the open door policy. So it's, it's all connected, which is fun. Other questions from the audience here in Corley Auditorium? 
I'll ask you about the uh, earthquake of January 2010. Um, the U.S. obviously fell fell short. Um, did they do anything right uh, in helping the Haitians during that time period? And and what what else could have been done? Yeah, I mean, so that that's a that's a good question. I mean, and it's really easy to sort of take this like blanket condemnation of all U.S. actions uh, way too far. Um, and I mean, I think trying to bring the different countries together, trying to channel the aid. One of the more interesting sort of developments out of the, that has been uh, the Haitian uh, Land Policy Institute, I think I have to look up the name, working group, uh, where for a lot of Haiti, there's not clear title to the land that who owns whichever parcel of land is actually severely disputed. And for some of the people uh, who have these small holdings, they like it being disputed. Uh, they don't want a major survey of the country of who owns exactly what, uh, but rather just kind of get along um, as they can, because if there's a survey then it's easy to buy their land off from underneath them or force them off of the land um, by, you know, through various court cases and whatever else. Um, but I think, you know, just trying to, again, establish some state capacity, uh, certainly being there in sort of that moment to provide uh, medical support, you know, and to take care of critical care cases. Uh, some, yeah, you know, the U.S. Navy sent various hospital ships, which weren't all bad. Um, but also, again, you know, there's just sort of this, we're going to go in and in the parlance of Silicon Valley, which is how we often think about when we come to go into foreign countries, is we're going to move fast and break things so we can write our own destiny uh, without looking at the factors on the ground. And we sometimes have a little bit better luck if we stop to look at, you know, what's actually happening, um, what local actors, what locals are already doing to dig people off from underneath the rubble. Um, and, you know, are we actually helping establish a strong civil society? Um, are people able to go to work, have jobs, take care of their kids, all these sort of very basic uh, concerns when, you know, making sure that there's a strong economy, that schools can be open and whatnot. Anyone else? Okay, Dr. Tabor, uh, thank you. One more time. It's been a pleasure. You know, you did a lot of talking back-to-back -back presentations and uh, we, uh, we do appreciate it and, and wish you all the best. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.